Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Men have long expressed interest in the matter of their true nature, believing that they have lost it and would like to return to it. But the more knowledgeable realize it is an error to look back. And in fact, awakening could be described as the discovery of one's new true nature. One day, one man thought, I'd like to get back to my roots. And death suddenly said, you called? <laughs> And the man was instantly struck by the possibility that this might be so. <laughs> to discover paradise, one must leave Eden. And to leave from there, one must begin. To discover paradise, one must leave Eden. And not just leave it, but operationally forget that it ever existed. There was once a clear land upon which a fog fell, one of such magnitude that soon everyone there accepted it as normal. Well, not everyone exactly. The head of a mystical order one day so said to his listeners, the secret is the missing piece in everyone's thinking. And from the audience, a voice replied, well, that's obvious. And the speaker responded, that's right. You've got it. <laughs> there was once a planet of robots. And to help them develop further, life provided mechanical birds to sit atop their heads and give directions. <laughs> On the midway. Man's normal mental life is like a carousel that, should it ever stop, would be destroyed. Mm -hmm. On one world was once a race of creatures who were each born with an empty billfold. And their progress was measured by the amount of stuff they managed to put therein. And most were satisfied with the arrangement. Though there were a few weirdos who felt like there was something else possible to do with this birthright. One day a fellow so reflected, why does man picture himself to consist of two aspects? A physical side run entirely by pre-programmed automatic instincts and an intellectual side which he thinks of as being initially unprogrammed and operated totally by free choice and decision. He rubbed his chin and pondered it deeply, having serious personal questions regarding the validity of the standard view of the intellect, but at least reached a temporary degree of satisfaction by realizing that the whole affair was a product solely of the intellect. To hide out in prominent hotels under what better assumed name could the secret register than that of Mr. Simple and Obvious? To help discourage potential discoverers, life displays in all major locations a sign reminding that all shoplifters will be severely prosecuted. All right, I owe you a dollar. Because I don't know why I'm stupid enough to take the bets about which one's going <laughs> to. The advantage in being of ordinary mind is that you can think of yourself as being whatever you can think of. Without all that nasty effort, the more conscious have to go through. Yeah. W-D-Y-M-O-T-F-T. -T. What do you make of the fact that? Men accept that for a thing to survive, it must change, as with the law, science, the arts, in all areas, save religion and the mystical. Hmm. Why the sole exception? Hmm. 
Seeking enlightenment by way of ordinary thought is not unlike creatures who have painted themselves purple, now trying to undo it by painting themselves green. To help focus and control his attention, one man began to carry a hot coal around in the palm of his hand. But his body, being no fool, to protect itself soon learned to ignore the pain. So I ask you, what are you going to do? <sighs> and one man so ruminated. Is it not natural for man's intellectual awareness to be as diffused as his physical? Huh? <laughs> All myths arose from a single myth, the original mystical one, which proved to be more than most people could take. Thus, the proliferation of the alternatives. How to tell on the train those who have no idea where they're going. How to tell on the train those who have no idea where they're going. They're the ones always talking about it. See, another reason that the more conscious don't have to physically die to get the job done. They can learn to be quiet while they're still alive. <laughs> A teacher asked a student, what kind of house is noiseless on the outside and noiseless on the inside? And the lad replied, one that is yet to be built. And a semi-snoozing boy in the back of the room nudged his neighbor and asked, are they talking about extended states of awareness again? And that it has already been noted here that was it not man's that was not man's mind innately incapable of seeing the obvious, that the progress he has thus far achieved would not have been possible, perhaps you'd enjoy a further related fact to wit. Wrangling makes the merry go round. Yeah. <laughs> or if that was too, wrangling makes, I mean wrangling runs the merry go round. And now on a completely unrelated note, another installment in our series, Why, I-R-I-F-O-Y. Yo, it's right in front of you. A man fidgeting his feet is thinking with his feet. Yo, it's right in front of you, both your body and your mind. Yo. There was once two brothers, and one of them had a book filled with words, and the other had a book filled with numbers. And eventually the first one claimed that he had a cousin who had a book that was filled with anatomical drawings, <laughs> only to have his brother then assert that he had a nephew who had a book that was filled with food recipes. And as this inter-family rivalry escalated, they ultimately conjured up between them the images of man's entire subsequent intellectual legacy. Now, I don't consider that a full loss. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not paying off on that one. Mortal existence as a life in professional sports. First, you're drafted into the league. You play for a while, then they kill you. <laughs> or, as Mr. Abner said to Tua Day, what a bummer, only to be reminded that he had the wrong game in mind. One man's ponder for the day. Is being more conscious simply knowing where you are at every moment? <laughs> Physically and instinctively, a normal man always knows where he is. Mentally, it's another matter. <laughs> and now today's overall rumination. Does it not seem natural for man's intellectual awareness to be as diffused as his physical? Huh? A being from another world who could read minds after a visit to earth mused, if men's actions were actually as directed by their thinking as they believe, their planet would by now be without them. In the matter of camouflage and duplicity, 
One man says he has begun to think of reality as that thing passing itself off as life. Once you've been bedded and fetted, the only things left is to be mentally entertained or informed, with the former consisting almost exclusively still of physical things vicariously pursued, and the latter confined mostly to matters of a practical material nature. Regarding the matter of interest and attraction, one man so pondered, if mystics aren't weird enough for real weirdos and too weird for intellectuals, then who do they appeal to other than one another? A more conscious mind never relies on or presents local examples or personal anecdotes as proof of anything. Corollary. Transcendental knowledge is never in any fashion racially, religiously, culturally, nationalistically, or gender specific or dependent. And the guy mused, well, no wonder it's so easily heard by everyone. <laughs> And now another response to that eternal question, what is it to be human? It is to say that you want one thing, but to be perfectly happy accepting something else. <laughs> the speaker so challenged his audience, what could be more difficult than to whip up overt enthusiasm in a bunch of mystics? And a voice shouted back, the ease with which it can be done. And just because it rhetorically didn't make sense doesn't mean that it didn't mean anything. Another way in which the mind is magical is that it is the only creature that can be in two places at once. Although those of greater understanding might question the positive connotations of the word magical, to get on the path, everyone starts off being somebody else's kind of mystic and ends up being their own kind. Proverb update. If indeed it was true that what goes around comes around, then everyone would choke to death who repeated more than once any cliché. It is only the normal thinking of man which can see recovery from an illness as progress. To the body, this is foolishness, and also to the mind of the more conscious. Theological update. All religious stories have hidden within them stories of actual value. In the first year class of Transcendental Studies, a student asks, what should an aspiring mystic be thinking of? Things mystical? or everyday things from a mystical position. In the second semester of first year Transcendental Studies, another student asked, whose thinking is more rushed than excited? Ordinary men under stress or the more conscious? How it's ultimately played. When push comes to shove, hormones will push and instinct will shove. All right. The human mind is the only contender in this galaxy who, in the midst of constant losing, can continually proclaim itself victor. And men yet consistently under-evaluate the talents of the mind. <laughs> Litigation update. If everyone's thinking is a franchisee of life, then mystics are those engaged in legal disputes with the franchisor. Though humans insist on believing otherwise, when one man imposes his will on others, it is never his intellectual will that's involved. No man is fully human who is not mentally agitated and dissatisfied, and certainly none not fully and certainly none fully realized who do not wish freedom therefrom. Is the difference then between the ordinary and those on the move, the difference between the letters W and S, as in between the words wish and seek? 
If you are still uncertain as to whether man's mind or body is the more graceful, talented, and intellect and intelligent, look at the generally free flow of traffic even on crowded highways, then at the impending impeding congestion normally extant in man's mental life. <laughs> to the more alert, memory is of significance only when operating as an instant constant. Put another way, if you have to think about it, it's already too late. A young monk asked the elder head of the order, is it possible for a man to become so mystical minded that he's no longer ordinary minded? And the more ancient one replied, yeah, if he's nuts. <laughs> one day, two young followers in a mystical lodge were talking and one of them said, what I enjoy most about the answers I receive to my questions from our leader is how totally unexpected in nature they often are. To which his friend replied, curious, curious, but for the same reason do I find them upsetting and unpleasant. Which again goes to show that you simply can't please everybody unless you kill them first. <laughs> the active pursuit of the secret requires that mentally you nail to the floor one of your many fidgety feet. One day, past midway in his life, a man's mind said, it's hard to believe that we've come this far together. And the man thought, hard to believe, hardly begins to cover it. The speaker so declared to the assembled, everyone has a story to tell about themselves, and several people in the crowd immediately vanished, and a kid standing nearby mused, you don't usually see so many mystics at a public gathering. <laughs> to pick up and to tie a few more pieces and to... Uh, what we were talking about last time, and for those who didn't see it, I'll have to, I guess, remind you right quick. Uh, two things. One was from a news item from last time that said the best cons are always simple and crude, and I even gave a description of a, at least in certain circles, a very well-known con that was pulled, and rather than being extremely complex and staggering the mind and being arcane, intellectually challenging, the good ones are just as simple as they can be. Now, see that I necessarily have to repeat the example, but and the other one was a story I enacted, which I about have to do for, to remind you about the guy that went into a establishment that advertised suits for all price ranges and needs and the guy was somewhat out of the ordinary if not monetarily speaking physically speaking and they whipped out a suit on him and he complained that the sleeves were too long and the salesman said well what you do is you pull them up get them right where you want them and then hold your arms like that and he said okay he said but the pants don't fit they're too long and too bunchy and he said well pull up and the access and hold your thighs together and then pull them up to the length you want and hold your knees together and you got it and he says all right and he pays and he leaves you remember he's walking down the street and a couple of old ladies pass by one of them says look at the shape the poor the terrible shape that poor boy is in and no one says yeah but don't his suit fit nice yeah. now start with the first one I mentioned again first that the best cons are always crude and simple. Consider how life, and also I'm going to bring up another one from last time also about why it is that men speak so highly of the dead, the recently dead, those who have been dead a longer period of time. But let's start with that the best cons are always simple and crude. And consider how life keeps man's mind from ever seeing the obvious while making him continue to ponder, debate, theorize, and argue over all of the many 
other surrounding possibilities, such as, for those of you that didn't say it last time, about the one I just mentioned about why men speak so highly of the dead, and if that's brought up, and it's brought up also, if I just make up an example which plays itself out in real life every day, but if I were to say that the man laid out before us who's being eulogized was known by all attendees to be a ne'er-do-well, no one particularly cared for him, he had no sense of honor, and now, dead a few hours, a day, and they're standing there crying, speaking of the man as though he were a saint reincarnated, and I say, what's going on? Now, there are all sorts of possibilities. I just pulled out a handful, but the surrounding possibilities of a person looking at that situation, and probably everyone's been in it, and there is no shortage of possible explanations that life just seems to suddenly bring to men's minds. That that is, they could, that it, they could have a kind of cynical view that, well, nobody means it. It's just, everybody's just bullshitting their way through it. Or you could say from a less cynical view, more psychologically based, that it's people, uh, even though they may indeed uh, have felt negatively about the man a few hours before when he was alive, but now they're speaking highly of him as a kind of compensating mechanism, a kind of attempt to relieve the guilt that they now feel, wishing that they had not been so hard and so judgmental on the man. And you could even say that uh, it's all, in a sense, individually meaningless as applied to this one man that we've already established is unworthy of such declarations of honor, that we're saying that this is simply a collective ritual, that it is simply a sign of good manners, that decent people would afford any deceased person the same sort of courtesy and the, the same kind of positive words as a send-off. You could say all of that. And those of you who saw it last, the last show, you know that I drug it out for about 45 minutes. Even I gave you the first warning that I was going to point out as a great example of a possibility that the mind would never consider, not as some sort of challenge that I was at any ordinary level so intelligent or so weird that I could see it. It is simply that man's mind is innately unable to directly perceive the obvious for a very good reason. But at any rate, let me show again. You could just, I could open up the floor, I could ask people to write in and say, well, what other possible reasons could be involved to make ordinarily, or who are ordinarily honest, decent men, including how about ministers and rabbis considered to be, or should be the living epitomes of truth, honesty. They stand there and, and participate in this facade, this charade. That is, they stand up there and bullshit their way through the minister the one who gives the final send-off, the one who begins to pull out uh, Holy Scripture about, well, he's now with God, or God promised all who live a good Christian life or Jewish life will live again. All these kind of positive words about how he deserves it, and the minister himself, above all people there. He may have counseled a man, been over to his family's residence many times, having to try and protect his poor wife from his drunken rages. In other words, the minister supposedly the community's standard bearer of truth, he's standing there lying through his mustache. And so you could say, well, how can this possibly be? What makes people do this? And after dragging it out last time, as you recall, I pointed out that there is a one possibility that the mind cannot conceive of that's laying right there in front of you. That as soon as I say it, ordinary minds will attempt to dismiss it and yet I also point out that based upon all ordinary concepts of reason, logic, scientific reality, common sense, there is no way that the mind can constructively assert that what I say cannot be. And that simply is that the answer to why people do this could be simple. That at that ordinary people, when they die, they immediately become better people, and that ordinary people are simply reacting to the reality of it without knowing it. And that a man dies, a bum, just an ordinary bum. He dies, and he becomes a better person, but the mind is not wired up, ordinary thought, to see that directly. 
but men are reacting to the reality of it. And that is why that they will stand there and apparently engage in cynical, duplicitous, invalid, disingenuous behavior, which they apparently are. You have to admit it by my description of an everyday occurrence, that is, of people staying there from his family to his debtors to his minister to his rabbi and speak about the man as though he were just a living saint when 24 hours before not one person in that room had a good word to say for the man, and deservedly so, let's say, from ordinary views. And how can this be? And you can speculate about all these possible examples I gave, these possibilities about why this happens, all the way from the mass, unspoken behavior, ritualistic behavior of civilized people, that is, that they just get up and do it for everybody, to individually, psychologically motivated Dramas wherein the person speaking is being driven by the guilt, by guilt of how they mistreated the man when he was alive, all the way from that to just the cynicism that a smart ass could have and say, well, people are just full of it anyway and it doesn't mean anything. You could go on and on with these examples, but notice life makes it in such a way that no one ever looks at that possibility. And it explains everything. You don't need any more possibilities, which is what the obvious is. Or for those of you who are getting slick, once you see the secret, it doesn't mean that you can't have a hobby of knowing a few other things, like you know how to tie your shoes or to work the remote on your TV. But once you know the secret of life, once you see what's going on, I mean, there's not a lot more to know or put to you another way. After that, there is nothing of any significance to know. There can be things that are entertaining because you might, if you discover the secret, let's say at the age of 30, I mean, what the hell, you're stuck for another probably 50 years. You've got to do something. <laughs> and so you can look around and take up a new hobby or something, intellectual hobby. But in so far as once you see what's going on, there are no other possibilities. I mean, you do not look around then at surroundings and go, well, let's see, what could be causing that? <laughs> once you see what's causing life, I mean, you got to... You should be able to see this, even from a, God forbid I have to say it, a logical view. <laughs> then once you see what's going on, then to have something new pop up or something you never thought about in a certain way, you have missed the whole point, even theoretically, about what the secret or experiencing the secret of what life is about, of then anything ever popping up, and you have to go, well, let me see. Let's see, what could this be? It simply doesn't happen. I mean, you can gesture all you want to. <laughs> but it simply does not happen. <laughs> Minorly or in stereo. <laughs> Consider, in case you lost your place, that I started the first paragraph out with the repetition of my news item statement that the best kinds are always simple and direct. Uh, <laughs> So if, if life wants to keep men from seeing a certain thing, which is a, I'll admit to you even having to use transcendental mystical type language, that's a piss poor way of having to describe it, but there is no way to describe it. It's not that life is trying to keep men from doing so and so, et cetera. But that's the only way to make the sentence go anywhere without me spending 14 years as a preface to one sentence. So if life is trying to keep men from seeing things in a certain way, which some of you, I can call it this way, is trying to keep men's minds at the ordinary level from reaching conclusiveness, which is detrimental. It'd be like men hobbling themselves in the general parade of progress. But let's take the easy description, because everyone likes this. It fits in with ideas of conspiracies. It fits in with ideas that men have in some way sinned, that men are in some way paying off a debt. Well, in some way, men are getting what they deserve. Yeah. Which is another test if you need it to see how ordinary you are. They say, well, people get what they deserve. And if any part of you, any molecule in your, up here, which is the ones that do it, if any of them go, Phew, <laughs> then you, you don't need a further test about how ordinary you are. If you still feel guilty about being alive, life in its kind is extremely pleased with your gullibility. At any rate, if life is trying to keep men 
from seeing a certain thing or seeing in certain manner, then the kind, the way to do it, is crude and supple. Instead of, if it's trying to keep him from seeing at the heart of every situation, let's put it that way, such as the ritual of men burying men, of burying the dead. To keep him from looking at the heart of what's going on, he has arranged, life has arranged the mind in such a way that you will look at every, if you're really good, but you will look at all the surrounding possibilities. That's the simple kind. Or the example, for those of you that did hear last time, you remember I went through that whole description of those people that, this one guy that went in, spent days and a whole big sham of a show about going through the books of this hotel that was for sale. Huge hotel with the eight restaurants and the ten bars and the 500 rooms and he holes up in the penthouse and he pretends to go through the books and keeps asking for more and more information and after about a week, they agree on a price of a million dollars. Shows how old the con game was. Ten million dollars. And he writes him a check. He said, I'll give you a check for a 330000 a third of it, and uh, my personal note because i got to transfer funds. i got to liquidate some assets in Europe. And at the end of the month, I'll present you with the other two-thirds of the ten million dollars. And what the hell? And they took it. The show was good. Anyway, and then the check bounces. He comes up with more and more stories. They keep redepositing. It didn't come back. Within a week or so, they call in their attorneys and their accountants. The guy's got the keys. He's in physical possession. He's in legal possession, technically, of the premises. And it gets closer and closer to the date of the remainder of the note the date when he has got to come up with the rest of the money, and evidently he can't even come up. He can't cover the original check he wrote. And there they sit, and they keep going for it. He says, well, read And they've done it two or three times to the point that any ordinary fool would give given up, and yet they sit over in their attorney's office, over at their accountants, pondering, should we put the check back in? And somebody says, well, we tried it three times. Something's wrong. And then they go, but something's even weirder. Why would he be doing this? I mean, he knows if he doesn't have the money, all it's going to be, what day is this? And they count, was well, another 10 days, and he's got to turn loose of it. We can then, it can become a criminal, for, well, we can then get a dispositionary warrant if we have to. We can definitely get him out, but they sit around and they can't believe. It becomes a challenge. It, it, they think, how smart, if this man is a con man, if, he, if this is a con, this is the damnedest thing. And they may even call in some expert, or call up some attorney, or call somebody else who specializes in fraud. And they, say, and they describe the situation, they say, what kind? It's just inconceivable. What's he up to? He knows he can't hold on to it. If he doesn't have any money, if he can't cover this down payment, and if we assume that he can't, that something's wrong, then we also got to assume he cannot certainly come up with the remainder of it due in 10 days. What was the point of all this? And they ponder and they think, and it was so simple. At the end of the time, they go there and they go, well, God damn it, that check still didn't bounce. You know, you're giving the keys back. So you give them the keys back. And he walks off. And they think for a while, what, in the, what the hell was the point of this? Until it took a day or so, at least, until somebody figured out that for one month, he'd been walking through the hotel and all the bars and casinos every two or three hours and cleaning out the cash register. How much simpler can it be <laughs> that was theft with a passable civil patina that protected the man for a month? Yeah. <laughs> Instead of walking in there every two or three hours to every cashier and every restaurant and every bar in the front desk and every two or three hours putting a gun and holding them up and then walking out, waiting two or three hours and come back and holding them all up, which <laughs> chances are he'd be caught after doing that two or three times. Instead of that, he did this. It is so crude that they couldn't even conceive of it. Man, well, I told you enough. Dressed up, spoke sharp, could speak a little French, had, well, very good manners, did not wear a suit that he had to do this. <laughs> and I'm still trying to think, what in the, it is inconceivable, what is his game? It was so crude, so simple, that they could not see it. Does that not sound like the way man's mind ordinarily works. 
life has it in such a way that if we don't look at it as a con being played on man, using that very allegorically. The con is that it's so simple and direct that if you have any doubt how bewildering, how bamboozling it is to men, go look in your local library, particularly in that first Dewey system section, wherein you find the tomes covering religion, philosophy, metaphysics, all forms of the occult and speculative, and there it is. Going all the way back, at least in the Western world, to the Greeks, there it is. The written history, and what it is, its owners, or the actual legal owners of that hotel, they're over sitting thinking, what in the hell kind of game is that guy playing? But instead of guy, mind. And they're speculating, what is, life, what is life about? And how come we can't seem to you know, really put our finger on it? It is too crude and simple. I mean, the guy turned the keys back over him and left. Maybe I should drug out the story in more detail, but I'm just giving you guys credit. Uh, it could easily have been, or I could make the story sound reasonable, that it took them two or three days to catch on. Imagine how big this hotel is, how many different cash registers they have, and how many different locales, and no one person. There they are, back at, you know, they're back in business. And there'd be all sorts of problems with now because they, he, the guy didn't pay any bills for a month, so I didn't point that out. I mean, if a liquor distributor came in to bring in some booze to a bar, most of that business has always been cash and carry. But if they came in and said, well, uh, you know, you owe me for last week. You didn't even pay for last week. The guy who now, the con guy, if they had to call him down, he'd tell him, you know, get screwed. And he'd call somebody else for the meat supplier. say, well, uh, you know, the original owners, the old owners used to pay me every two weeks. And he'd go out of here and he'd call somebody new and that thing was new business for a month he paid no bills so they come back and they take over imagine it'd be two or three days of them running ragged realizing he didn't pay bills here and there and the whole place would be in a turmoil but I assure you it could have been two or three or four days before somebody started checking around and realized no deposits have been made in the bank for a month they go they look in all the cash registers and there's no money and they finally began to ask some of the cashiers. Of course, by then, some of the cashiers, you got to understand, would have quit because he refused for a month. He paid no salaries. <laughs> as soon as somebody came, a cook or a cashier, said, well, I hadn't been paid in a week. He'd say, well, you know, tough shit. And he'd put an ad in the paper, put a sign out front that was there a whole month, you know, help wanted, top wages. Then anybody would come in just to get them, he'd say, you know, this cashier, he said, what you been making? They'd say five an hour. And he'd say, you get eight here. You know, you'd be paid, we get paid every two weeks or a month, whatever you put up with. He, no money went out. But imagine it take them days to piece it together and finally somebody go, wait a minute. And they'd have to keep checking, even if they come to suspicion and finally realize that nothing had been paid out and everything was taken away. Nope. That does not sound like the mind. Except the mind normally believes I'm gathering more and more information and pretty soon I'll be able to pay all the bills. The hotel will be mine. That is, understanding will be mine. I'll see what's going on. God bless man's little mind. Still faced with the fact that, well, to the best of my knowledge, being an educated, sophisticated, and denominator fellow that I am, I am aware that man has been working on this now for a good five, 6,000 years, and I am an expert. I am very well read in the ancient writings, and there's no doubt we're no closer now. We've made no progress in the important matters. We have been kind. Somebody has been upstairs in the penthouse. Somebody wrote us a bad check or a post-dated check. That is our minds. That, well, any day now, or at least it, just, it wasn't quite that specific to say, well, at the end of the month, you get the rest of your money. Here's a post-dated check. It is sort of like the mind gave man a post-dated check, but it was very vague. It was just like, it would, in fact, it'd be an unenforceable legal, or it'd be an unenforceable document because there has to be some specificity to it. But it's as though man's mind gave him a note, a post-dated check, but a note saying, you work on this, do good, keep in touch, be nice to your mama, go to church, be decent, 
and keep trying, of course, with this. And you will, this hotel will be yours. You will know what's going on. And then, uh, I'm not going to carry this allegory much further, literally. You've got to do it yourself. Then it's as though life, man's mind, it's life working via man's mind, now has all these extrinsic matters going on to the real con. His mind keeps, stays distracted. We're not talking about for a month like in this actual con game. We're talking about five, 6,000 years that you know of that the mind keeps going well. And it's like the mind, the man keeps going well, and the mind keeps saying, all right, redeposit the check. <laughs> you know, because the, the down payment check bounced. And you put it back in, like in the real con, they put it in several times. That killed a couple of weeks because they couldn't believe it. And it's all, oh, well, that's right, my, they didn't transfer my funds from my account in uh, Zurich. Put it back in. It takes a couple of days sometimes. It's, <laughs> so they put it back in. And it bounces right back. But it took them, they did it four or five times, I guarantee you. The first couple of times he had a story, but like the third or fourth time he'd just go, they'd say, well, hey, this check bounced again. This is the third time. And they're a little, getting a little peeved, and he would, he'd like peeved too. Well, damn it. Well, put it back in. You're right. I agree with you. This, enough's enough. And they would do it again, but back the phone, they couldn't believe because there was no conceivable reason that there's nothing to gain if he did not actually have the money for him to have gone through this. It's like man's reaction to his mind saying, well, any day now. You know, Chuck Jackson and Burt Bacharach are not the ones that came up with that song originally, any day now. It was man's mind. Well, it was life whispering backstage, prompting man going, any day now. And, it, and it's like he would think, well, well, I'm not getting any closer. I still don't understand what the hell's going on. And it's like his mind would say, put the check back in. And man had been doing it for thousands of years. Well, what does my mind have to, you know, what could it have to gain by conning me like this? If it is a con, it makes no sense. Yeah, it makes no sense because it is too crude and simple for the ordinary mind to see. That's what a good con is. Uh, also, along the way, when I was saying that the description of life trying to keep man from seeing something is not. It's not a valid description, but there is none. But let's take a sideways shot at it because to try and compensate some for it. I wrote a news item last time and threw it in again tonight in another way. Based back to the fact that man's life has man's mind wired up so that it has an innate inability to see. Right, now, from one view, once you catch on to what I'm inferring, of course, then you think, well, that is a drawback. That if I could see the obvious, then surely the secret is right behind it somewhere. So it would seem like, well, this is a drawback. That if you're taking my description to have some potential value, or you even think you're beginning to get glimpses of it on your own, then to say that man's mind has an innate inability to see the obvious, you could take as being... Uh, some flaw in man's thinking, some error or drawback in the way man's constructed. But were it not for this arrangement, then man in general would not have enjoyed the intellectual progress he has thusly. Some of you reacted audibly. I'll refer back to one that uh, said that wrangling runs the merry-go-round. At the ordinary level, intellectual progress as it seems, and let's don't debate the matter, it's just from ordinary views, it is certainly defendable that man has made intellectual progress as witnessed as nothing else by the improvement in his physical life. You look at intellectual progress as simply being technological progress, that we are now life easier, it takes less effort to survive, our lifespan has ex extended, etc. 
There is simply, from any ordinary view, it is uh, indefensible to say that man has not intellectually progressed. <laughs> of course, from a kind of transcendental view, it is not necessarily all that has been possible or is possible in an individual's life. But the progress that man has thus far enjoyed, even that would not have been possible were it not. I'm talking about the ordinary level, the mass level of man. Were it not for the fact that his mind has an innate inability to perceive the obvious. Put it to you another way, I've done it enough. This too is uh, not a quite valid statement, but there is none available, so here this one goes. That if ordinary men saw the secret, all it would do would disable them. That's all it would be accomplished. It is a disingenuous statement in that ordinary men can't see the secret, and once you get the point that you're capable of seeing it, then I suggest you can bear the consequences. <laughs> or if you can't, or if you can, if it proves otherwise, I'll tell you this: no one ever mourns the death of a mystic. <laughs> You follow? But if an ordinary, if humanity in general could see the obvious, rather than me make the, the secret sound like some great mystical one piece of knowledge, if men could, if men's minds were wired up to see the obvious in life, we would not be where we are, men in general, but if we were where we are now and suddenly men's minds were made capable of just seeing the obvious and what's going on, all it would do would be to disable men. It would cripple humanity. I put it to you real crudely. No one would get up in the morning to go to work. <laughs> People would eventually get up to find something to eat. <laughs> they would eventually, well, the same old, their instincts would eventually drive them to do that necessary to physically keep the race alive. But forget the world as we know it. Forget the world of commerce. Forget the world of art. Forget the world of anything other than being bedded and fetted. <laughs> being screwed. Being, being able to eat. Get out of the cold. That's it. Because if you saw the obvious, there'd be nothing to say. There'd be no arguments. There would be no energy to run the merry-go-round, which is man's mind. There would be no metaphorical aroma of flesh by which to keep the cannibalistic nature that is man's mind alive. <laughs> if you solved the obvious in life and you woke up in the morning and you weren't hungry, you weren't real horny, and you didn't have somebody with you if you were, and you just laid there and there was nothing particular going on, your sex organs weren't out of, weren't in an uproar, your stomach wasn't empty, it wasn't raining on you, you weren't freezing, and you were just laying there, I suggest most strongly, that take, saved the few mystics of the world, then on this planet you would have six billion people wake up in the morning, <laughs> lay there for a while, <laughs> lay there for a longer while, <laughs> lay there even longer, <laughs> and here and there people would begin to get up as they got hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, the intellectual progress that man has enjoyed thus far would be a thing of the very quickly arriving past. Uh, there's not much more to say about that. It's astounding on the surface. I know people here get used to, accustomed to hearing me talk like this or hearing ideas expressed like this. But uh, you understand that is astounding. It's unbelievable. The ordinary mind will reject it, even though, again, it's one of these situations if, for you to consider, not to prove that I'm correct. But you understand what I have just pointed out. Uh, forget whether it be absolutely true or not for a second. Just what I said, rhetorically, the use of the human language, the English language, what I just described about if men saw what I, whatever it is I refer to as the obvious. If they saw it, then it would disable the collective evolvement of man and then my descriptions of it. Ordinary thinking will reject it. It has no choice. It can't do otherwise. But I'm just asking you to consider there is nothing in that statement that is 
illogical. There is nothing that is prima facie irrational. It does not deny the sequential reason of ordinary men's thinking. In other words, they cannot listen to that and go, oh, wait a minute, I'll show you the flaw in that. Yes. Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. They say, wait a minute, it couldn't be. Uh-uh. It's not possible. It's, just, it's not there. Which, again, I was just using this as one of these off to the side of your house examples of the secret right out in the open rather than your front and backyard. It's just sort of there between you and your neighbor's driveway. But there it is again. This is as obvious as hell. And if you want another example of the obvious, it's that which, once you see it, or if you're good at listening, somebody else can point it out if they have to to start with. But then you eventually have to see it. But you see it, and it may be insane. It may be impossible. But you realize well, that's true. Or put, put in the negative, there, there's no way you can't even attempt it. You realize immediately, well, there's no way, if I tried to, that I can mentally refute this. Mm -hmm. The same mind of mine, my same mind that says, oh, no, you know, that can't be. You stop from it and you go, well, that same mind, I realize immediately. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to get a pencil and paper and diagram it. I immediately realize that is irrefutable. And so there you stand with a question I've popped up for you twice in the last fortnight. How can progress be both progress and non-progress? No. How can one thing be one thing and still not be that thing? I'll finally answer it for you. When that thing is obvious. <laughs> then, you, then you want to go. It's like, well, I see it, but no, I don't see that. Or it's like, well, I see that. And your mind says, no, you don't. And you go, and you go I agree with him. <laughs> well, that one I was going to try to tie in in five minutes is the suit. Don't his suit fit nice? I mean, look, remember the full punchline, the first observer seeing this guy go along. And somebody says, look at the terrible shape that poor man's in. And her friend says, yeah, but don't his suit fit nice? Do you see that tied to? Also, the kind of simplistic, crude con game that life has man's mind playing on him, that even though to make the suit fit, he has got to hold up the sleeves of his coat and the cuffs of his pants with his elbows and his knees, and walk in an unnatural position. <laughs> now forget the outside observers, which is always all of these good stories. I tried to slip it into you tonight about theological update within all religious stories. Hidden within them all is actually stories that have some value. <laughs> I can extend that and say inside of all myths, inside of all religious myths, are myths that actually have some value, or, you get real good, inside of all allegories. Or actual allegories that have some value. Yeah. <sighs> so forget the, forget the two observers. We have the guy now. To make his suit resemble something fitting. That is to keep the cuffs and the sleeves where they belong requires the use of his knees and his elbows and hunched over and an observer. But now forget these two observers. I'm still going to say it to make the punchline fit. But forget two people out there. His mom says, look at the terrible shape that poor boy is in. And another boy says, yeah, but don't his suit fit now. You don't see that as a man's thinking. You don't see that tonight I pointed out that within the context of a my alleged continuing series, what it is to be human. And tonight's example was, what it is to be human is to say that you want one thing, but be perfectly happy to settle for something else. A man's mind, life allows him to continue. That's what part of the progress is, as we know it. What we have achieved at the mass level is a man's mind continues to say, well, I'm not satisfied. And any man worthy to be called a man, he's not even a fully realized man at the ordinary level, unless he is dissatisfied and agitated mentally. That's to be man. That's to be an educated, normal, natural, minimally operational man. 
So a man's mind is continually telling him, God, look at the terrible shape I'm in. But then he says, yeah, but don't my suit fit nice? I'm still not satisfied with the way I think. I know I have not reached the proper fit. I know I'm kind of having to piece myself together to even get by out in public. I'm having to hold up my cuffs with my knees and the, my sleeves and my elbows. But God, it's comfy. I'm used to it. That is a man's present thinking, no matter what he says. And any, we've got to remember this, it's not cynicism. There is no irony in sight, unless you're blind. <laughs> but men say, to be ordinary, to be sane, to meet the minimal definition of a man, you have to be dissatisfied. You have to feel as though, I am not in good shape. I mean, look at it. I mean, look, look at what I'm, the position I'm in just to keep going. I mean, it's hard enough me being Eli Pincus. I mean, nobody knows, nobody knows the burden it is for me to be me. I mean, look at the terrible, I know it. I don't, nobody needs to tell me. I don't need a psychiatrist. I'm reflective. I'm philosophical. I know the terrible shape I'm in. And you can't go on like that, of course, and be sane. And so you're, another voice says, yeah. But damn, my suit fits nice. <laughs> that, hey, I'm used to it. And so a man can say, I, I do want to change. I do want to know what's going on with life. By God, I do want to understand things. But I'm human, and I'll be perfectly happy to settle for less. <laughs> that is... God, look at the terrible shape I'm in. I'm nothing at all like I started out to be. I'm nothing at all like I planned to be. There's nothing at all like I was determined to be. But damn, don't my suit fit nice. Keep it in mind that you already know. The human mind knows. That's why the story fits. That the, the cuffs at the right length, the sleeves are, the pants fit nice in the thighs, only due to the fact that you're holding them up your knees, your elbows, you're hunched over like this, and you know it's unnatural. To you, I'm not saying it is. It's you feel like, well, it's a burden being John Smith, Jane Doe, and to live like this. But don't my suit fit nice? There is the ultimate con. It couldn't be cruder. It couldn't be simpler. And you start out saying, I don't want to be like this. I am human. And to be human is to say, I want one thing, but then be perfectly happy to accept something else. I am deformed. I don't look right. I'm in terrible shape by all appearances to me. But hey, I got to the point that my suit fits. You and head. That's a figure of speech, of course. But you are human. You'll, satis you'll accept something else. And that is part of how man continues, or the mind continues to delude people, even those that believe that they are trying to climb aboard the great mystical express, is that they will simply say, well, I want to. Now, wait a minute. I understand. I understand the limitations of the human mind. I understand my limitations. And I don't mind admitting it. <laughs> but as soon as you say that, you're saying, but don't my suit fit nice? You can't do one without the other. And for those of you that didn't get the final connection, was a speaker addressed the assembled and says, every man has a story to tell, a personal story about his life. And there in the midst of them, just here and there, several people just disappeared. <laughs> and a kid staying nearby, amused himself, he said, you know, it's not... All that usual, it's not that common to see that many mystics out in a public crowd. Because <laughs> if you say, look at the terrible shape I'm in, or worse than that, if you say anything, you are entertaining the human mind, and if you say anything, you're going to end up one way or the other. Because if you're normal, you're never satisfied with what you think. With your degree of knowledge, that is a proof of sanity. That's evidence of sanity. And so you're going to end up one way or the other saying, 
look at the unacceptable shape I appear to be in. And if you say that, you've got no choice. The mind may not say it in words that you hear, but if you want to say that, to stay sane, you've got no choice. To continue to be ordinary, another voice will say, yeah, but don't his suit fit nice? <laughs> and it's as though life says, your mind says, oh, put the check back in again. Run it through again. And you think, why not? I've only been doing it now for 6,000 years. I mean, what? It's got to, it'll go through sometime and buy me a nice fitting suit. It's got to go through sometime. Why else, why else would life make me continue to redeposit it and tell me to? If it was not, eventually, some, it's sometime must stay. It's a transient, it's an, a transient systemic anomaly. It's just a passing flaw in the system, and I'm sure, all right, I will put it back in. And a man smiles to do so. Because man's mind says, what I want is to have $10 million in the bank. And life says, you got it. <laughs> Here's a post-dated check. And you put it in, and it, the day it comes due, or it's due on the 30th, 30th of the month, it bounces, and life says, put it back, and you put it back. And it keeps doing it. But you said, I want $10 million. I'll accept no less. You're human. Mm -hmm. You say that you want one thing, but you are perfectly happy to accept something else. Less than $10 million in this case. Not $5 million, not $1 million, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but don't the check fit nice? I mean, every time it bounces back, it fits right in the palm of my hand. I mean, it's a terrible check. Look at the check my bank account's in. Yeah, but don't the check fit nice? I mean, right here in my hand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It all get